about it. I think I can show you from the scriptures as to why we believe in life. Life's such a great choice. Well, I, before I start preaching, and I usually don't connect with Facebook when I preach, I got to look at you guys for a second. So I got to see who's here today. And they took the kid, most of the kids out. There's still, there's still one there, I see, and a couple, three here that I'm glad to see. Uh, boy, we miss you. We really have. It's great to be in church. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for the day you've given us and for the opportunity to gather this last, uh, last day of January. We finally come back together at the church here at Harvest. And we're, we're grateful, Lord, that you've allowed us to assemble here this day. And we pray, Lord, for each and every need that might be in this place or the needs that are represented by the people that are here as far as their loved ones or extended family and friends. We ask, Lord, for you to intervene, intervene and, and, and help in each and every situation. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. The, uh, the Bible mentions that when we get saved, it's a, we, we turn away from our old life and we, we turn to Jesus. And I was, I was reading in 1 Thessalonians 1.9 and it says, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God or the living and true God. Turned to God from idols. So it's a matter of turning from all that's not of the Lord and turning fully to the Lord. It was the mandate that was given the Apostle Paul in Acts 26, the words of Jesus in verse 18, it says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. We want people to be turned from the darkness to light. We want people to be turned from the, the, the power of Satan, it says, unto Almighty God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. When you turn away and turn toward, well, the first thing that happens is God cleanses you of your sin. And then it says we have an inheritance among them who are sanctified by faith that is in me. And so it's important to turn. My question is, what will it take to get people turned to the Lord? What will it take to get people to hear His majestic voice? Uh, what will it take for people to see the majesty of Jesus that we just celebrated? He is majestic, isn't He? We need to turn to Him. In Lamentations, after Jeremiah, Lamentations, a few chapters long, the fifth chapter, verse 2, a prayer. It's a, it's a, it's a weighty prayer. It's a, it's a heartfelt prayer. It says, Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned and renew our days of old. That's kind of like the good old days, but we'll not go there. Give us the good old days. Uh, Lamentations 5.2, it says, Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days of old. It's like the prayer indicates we won't turn to the Lord if He doesn't turn us. capable of turning without His help. Turn us unto Thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days of old. The Good News translation says, bring us back to You, Lord. Bring us back. The uh, message says it like this. Bring us back to you, God. We are ready to come back. Give us a fresh start. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be back here today. But if you're away from the Lord and you're listening in today, I, I, I want to just tell you, I believe God's calling you. I believe God is speaking to you. I believe God is moving your heart that you might turn from all that's not of Him 
and turn fully unto Him this day. Turn to the Lord. You'll never be sorry. It's called the Alcatraz of Asia Minor. It's a desolate island, or it was at the time. You can see pictures of it today. It actually like, looks like a place you might want to visit today. It's a volcanic island. It's only about six miles in width and about 10 miles in length. But during the day, the biblical days, when John the Apostle was about 90 years of age, it was a prison island. It was called Patmos. It was a prison island and it was rock, a volcanic island. And there was mining and quarrying work that was uh, conducted by those who were there. And it was back-breaking work and it was required of all the prisoners. It was an undesirable place. Nobody wanted to be there. You could look it up today, Google it. You might want to visit if you had the money to get there someday. You would understand that uh, the last book of our New Testament was written in that island. And that, 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 that story of Revelation, that those words from the book of Revelation came to John while he was in uh, the island of Patmos. That's why a lot of people choose to visit that place because it was there God gave the unfolding of all of history to John. John was uh, in prison because of his faithfulness to proclaim the Word of God. It's in the ninth verse of chapter 1 in Revelation. He said, I, John, who also am your brother. He's writing it to seven churches. We'll talk about it later. He's writing a letter to seven churches. That's what he was authorized to do. And he said, I, John, who also and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because of his faithfulness to Jesus Christ, he was exiled to this prison island. There's some... There's some uh, I don't know how accurate the history might be, and maybe you've heard it, that they actually boiled John in oil, but he survived it. And so what do you do when you can't kill a man by boiling him in oil? You send him to Patmos. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but I've just read that historically, and you could look it up and verify it as well, that that's one of the things that's said about John. He's down in his 90s, and uh, he's in a prison island. That's no way to treat the apostle whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, but he was treated shamefully. Sometimes, and people are always asking me, what are we going to go through? You know, is there going to be tribulation or are we going to make an exit? You understand, don't you, that there are believers right now suffering great tribulation because of their faith. And many have given their lives already and presently. Some are detained and some are incarcerated. Some, some are being treated shamefully, if you didn't know. There are those that are tortured for Christ today even. And have been through the years. And then we wonder, will we be spared? Will we, we be spared persecution or hardship? Uh, I don't know, John wasn't. How many believe John, Jesus loved him? Uh, he loved him. John was pretty convinced that he loved him. Sometimes we're not spared unjust treatment. And sometimes hardship happens. And sometimes life gets uncomfortable. And it looks like the devil has everything going his way. And I would defy anyone to challenge John in his walk with the Lord and say he brought it all upon himself. Did John know nothing of faith? Maybe someone would say today. Didn't he know that you could faith your way out of something like that? Didn't John understand the authority of the believer? And couldn't he put the devil to flight and escape all of this misery that he was going through? 
I hate to use words that are used by others, but come on. <laughs> I'll leave off part of it. Come on. Challenge his walk with our Lord. He gave us the fourth gospel that bears his name. He gave us three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he gave you the last book in your New Testament. He was a man of God. He loved Jesus. And he suffered. He suffered for the cause of Christ. And now we wonder, will anyone hazard their lives again for Jesus Christ? John was in an extreme environment. He was in the worst of circumstances. But God visits him. And He visits him with voice and vision. It's in the first chapter of Revelation. It's beyond verse 9. In verse 10, He said, I was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now there's a lot of people that have definition as to what it is to be in the Spirit. And some of them may be right and some of them may not be even close to right. But for John, he said, I was in the Spirit. And he's writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit, so we know he's exactly right. I believe it's an experience beyond the normal senses. Uh, and, and, and in response to being in the Spirit on the Lord's day, he heard a great voice. I believe that's what this generation needs to hear. This generation is hearing a lot of voices, but we need to hear the great voice of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know who you're listening to, but God help you if you're not listening to Jesus. We need to heed the voice of our Savior. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It's amazing when you're in the Spirit how the Spirit directs you to the voice and vision of Jesus. It's, it's the Holy Spirit that glorifies Jesus. He will always lead you to Jesus. You say, well, I'm, I'm under, the, you know, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But if it's, not, if it's not making Jesus great, then something's really wrong. Jesus said, He won't speak of Himself. He will glorify Me. He, he will take what I, what I have and, and reveal it to you. Spirit. It's supernatural experience. I don't know that he was thinking it was going to take place. I, I firmly believe he was totally surprised. I think he was taken off guard. He, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now most of us here today, we, we'd think, well, that was Sunday. That was probably the Lord's day. Sunday, the day he rose from the dead. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And then he heard behind him. It was behind him. It doesn't say it was in front of him. It was behind him. The voice was from behind and it was like a trumpet. Like a trumpet. Like a trumpet. Well, the trumpet is significant in Scripture. It's significant in the second coming of Jesus Christ. The trumpet shall sound. The trumpet was to call to convocation for people to come. It could be a battle cry. You want to hear a little funny story? It was in a little flea market thing. And I looked at this. Uh, it looked copper to me. And it was about this long. It was a horn. It looked like a horn. It had a mouthpiece. It had some stuff wrapped around it. A couple places looked like for hand, for your handhold. And it, I think it had $16.95 on it. I said, who in the world would give $16 for that? Right? Well, I made a trip back in one day, and a few weeks ago, and it had a slash to it. And I looked over, and I thought, what does that slash mean? And that slash had three different colored slashes, and this particular slash, 75% off. Well, I'm not real smart, but I did my math real quick in my head, and I think I'm going to buy that, whatever it is, for four bucks. <laughs> At least it's a conversations piece. So I, uh, I take it up and I said to the people that were attending the store, I said, what is this? And they said, we don't know and we don't even know where it's been. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I, I paid my 
$4, $3 and something, and took it home. And I'd had the COVID, you know, and my lung capacity back to where it should be. That was one of the symptoms I had was a shortness of breath. So I've been, I was, I was going to use that after I, I promise you, I cleaned the mouthpiece. <laughs> but I, uh, I was able to uh, blow, blow it finally. I practiced, didn't get anything two or three times. And then finally, I just realized you just got to, you got to blow into it with all you got. And it made a, it made it sound like a moose sound, didn't it? It was, it was a, it was a, a sound anyway. And then I decided, well, I'm going to look this thing up. I've got to figure out what it is. Nobody else seems to know. So I looked it up, and, uh, oh, I think Etsy, and there's a few others. Hard to, hard to find it, but it was, a, it was called a hunting horn. And if you, ever, if you ever saw pictures of a fox hunt with the horses and the dogs, you'll usually see somebody with a, with a horn, to, I guess, to announce the hunt. And uh, it's always a hunting horn, and, and I saw one for $140, looked just like my $4 one. So I'm feeling better about my $4 one, you know. <laughs> so the grandson and granddaughter were up, uh, Cole Matthews was up there, and he's young and tough and stout and got lots of lung capacity. I said, you want to try to blow this? And he said, yeah, I'll do it. And I said, well, I'll wash the mouthpiece for you. And he, he, uh, he started low, and after he'd practiced once, I think, he, he, right off, he blew it, and he'd, I could only make a blast on it. Short blast, promise you, this much of a blast. But when he blew it, it, it you know, and then he raised the horn, and he said, that's like a battle cry. And it, it really was. And I, so I was hoping he could be here today to blow it for you. But there's a trumpet. Behind me is a great voice as a trumpet. It was a trumpet blast. Now, but we've had a lot of fun with that horn, and we're going to continue to have fun with it. He said this, the voice that uh, spoke like a trumpet, a great voice, said, I'm Alpha and Omega. That's the first Greek letter, last Greek letter, the A and the Z of what we would know in our alphabet. The first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and to Pergamon, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And he names the seven churches. These are actual churches. He wanted the letters sent to those churches. Now look at this next part. I turned... I turned and I turned. I tell you what, the Holy Spirit has really captured my heart with that portion of the verse. It might not mean anything to anybody else, but it means a lot to me. I'll tell you, when Jesus speaks to us, we need to turn and give our attention to Jesus. He turned. He turned to see the voice. Now, we don't usually turn to see voices. We turn to hear voices, especially when you're my age and have hearing loss. You want to turn to see the lips move so you can read lips and try to understand what's being said. But it says he turned to see the voice that spoke with me. He said, I turned to see the voice which spoke with me. Did he recognize the voice? He'd been familiar with that earthly voice of Jesus when uh, the Word was made flesh. But now, fast forward about 60 years, and now the voice rings in his hearing once again. I turn to see the voice. You got to turn. You got to turn to hear the voice and see the voice of Jesus. He visits John with voice and vision. I turned. Have you turned at the voice of God? You know, we often face the wrong way in life. We often focus on the wrong things. We often get wrapped up in things that really aren't necessarily of God. We need to turn at the voice of God when He speaks. Our response needs to be to turn. 
Turn toward Him, not away from Him. We've got to turn away from all else. That which would distract and that which would detract. And my question is, what will it take to get people to turn to the Lord? Just what will it take to get our nation to turn back to the Lord? It seems like we're, we're turning away from the Lord in defiance of the Lord. Now we've decided we'll, we'll ask taxpayers to pay for abortions, even internationally. As a nation, we're, we're apt to do that. We're apt to send millions of dollars to Planned Parenthood. Who, you know, it's, well, it's, it's, it's just bad what's taking place in the realm of abortion. Six, over 60 million since 1973. It's an incredible, incredible slaughter that's taken place. I had this message on wanting to be a voice for life, and I didn't think, I didn't see it coming up today, I got to tell you. I did not. I was going to talk to you about turning to the Lord, but when I got to the part about our nation not turning to the Lord, we're turning away from the Lord if we want to amp up the killing of babies. God's not for killing babies. I put something in my notes of a message that I was going to preach a couple of weeks ago that we weren't able to gather. You ever seen the Vietnam Memorial, at least a picture? Have you ever seen the wall? Maybe the replica that's traveled around? Maybe you've been to Washington to see it? I haven't been. I understand that the Vietnam Memorial Wall has about over maybe 58,000 names on it. The wall is 500 feet long. It's black granite. And I think it uh, is askew, uh, the, and uh, at the top it's 10 feet in the middle, and then it angles down toward the ground and comes, when it finishes up, about 246 feet both ways. I think it's about 8 inches above ground. It contains uh, 58,000 plus uh, names of those who died in Vietnam and Southeast Asia during, during the war, during the Vietnam War. What if you made a similar wall for the babies killed by abortion? More than 60 million, maybe 62 million since January 2nd, 1973. How long of a wall would we need if it was like the Vietnam Wall, which I understand diminishes in height as it goes, but it's 500 feet long when you put it together. About 500 feet long. That's a football field and two-thirds of another one, isn't it, Jeff? Help me out a little bit. That's a big, big, long wall. Well, you've got to multiply. You've got to multiply by a thousand. And if I did my math right, and I'm not a Purdue, Purdue engineer, you know that. But you've got a wall of about 94, 95 miles long, and that's a long wall. And it gives you an idea of what's taking place. We need to be a voice for life. We must not go down into silence. Our nation needs to be turned away from the atrocity of abortion. In Jesus' name, terminating the life of an unborn boy or girl should be unthinkable. Can you say amen? We must not take the innocent pre-born baby boy or girl from its mother's womb. It is a moral evil. It's not, some want to make it only a political issue. It's far from that. It is a moral evil. And I'll tell you what, being for a baby's right to life is not about being against women. Because I'm not against women and neither is Jesus. But it is about the baby's right to live. And I think that we can love both and we should love both and we do love both. We love the expected mother, expectant mother and we love that baby. Well, I won't go into that anymore because I need to come back to my message today. We need to be turned toward the voice of Jesus. We've got to be turned. And I believe that God will help us get turned in the Spirit. Have you ever been in the Spirit? Have you ever ex had an experience beyond your normal senses? Has the Holy Spirit ever come upon you to empower you to perceive revelation from God uh, have you ever been carried away into a, sort of a supernatural state? And you might say, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever had anything like that. 
Well, you that know Jesus, do you know that was a supernatural event? You know that you would have never come to know Jesus without the activity of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who reveals Jesus to you. And so if you're saved, you have experienced one of the greatest supernatural events anyone could ever experience. You were born again. You were dead in trespasses and sins, but you've been made alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that same Spirit, it says, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and will also quicken your, your mortal body. There was a loud voice here in, that accompanied John's turning. That loud voice. And it was the Son of Man. That title is used here. And it was a title that Christ most often used of Himself in the Gospels about 81 times. We don't want to forget the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We don't want to uh, forget that, that God is with us. Thou shalt call His name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. We didn't read it, but uh, he said, I turned to see the voice, that's in verse 12, that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, better translated lamp stands, not a menorah with candlestick coming up, but, a, but actually something to hold the lamp stand, to hold the lamp rather, it is the lamp stand, and that's what he saw. He saw seven of them. Remember, there were seven churches. And before we get done reading here, we understand that those lampstands represented the seven churches. And Jesus had something to say to each of those seven churches. And I just wondered if you would care if Jesus had something to say to Harvest. We're, how many believe we're a real church? Would, you, would Jesus have something to say uh, to Harvest in the way of uh, correction or commendation or or judgment? What would He have to say to us if He wanted to speak to us? And would we be willing to turn and hear His voice speak to us? Uh, it says, in the midst of the seven lamb stands one like the Son of Man. That's verse 13. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the breast with golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool and white as snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet like fine brass as if burned in a furnace. And his voice like the sound of many waters. Like a thousand Niagara Falls. His voice reverberated. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of the mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. It just, just totally overwhelmed him. It short-circuited him. He fell down as a dead man. This is Jesus in all of his glory. And he laid his hand, his right hand, upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my hand and the seven golden candlesticks or lampstands, the seven stars, the angels, or the messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. Jesus loves the church. You'll notice it says He was in the midst of the church. He was standing in the midst of the church. And He wanted John to write a message to each of those churches. I think that we... This is our first service of the year. How many of you would welcome the Word of Jesus for us in a time like this? How many of you would vow to turn to hear the voice of Jesus in an hour like this? I tell you, you can hear about anything you want to hear these days. Well, actually, they're muffling the voices of some, aren't they? Some are trying to be silenced and censored and canceled. But, you know, I don't think anybody's going to be able to cancel the voice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How about you? Let me close uh, here today emphasizing the, 
the, the message that we must turn. It's crucial in this hour that we turn to Jesus. Uh, let me start in verse 1. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto Him to show unto His servants things which shortly must come to pass. And He sent and signified it by His angel unto the servant John. So it's the, uh, this is the unveiling. This is what the word means. Uh, the word apocalypsis is from the Greek, which, which is translated the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, most people, when they think about uh, the uh, apocalypse, they're, they're thinking of something, you know, that's really bad, destructive, the, the end of the world. But the word actually means to show or, or expose or to view. It's to disclose or uncover. So it's the unveiling, the explaining, the making known, the revealing of what we would celebrate today is that so that he's making known spiritual truth to us. What, what's been a mystery is now being made clearly visible. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. And we'll investigate more, but let me close with verse uh, 5. Down the middle of it, it says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He loved us. He washed us. In his own blood, and the next verse says, he's made us a kingdom of priests. That's what Jesus has done for every one of us. He loved us, and because he loved us, he's cleansed us. And because he's cleansed us, he's made us into a kingdom of priests. That is that we have been given ministry assignments, and we want to be faithful in those, especially during these days. Let's rise up and be faithful for the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. You're, you're apt to be jostled a little bit. Not just by the world. But I believe the Holy Spirit is going to do some amazing things. In getting people's attention. Have you ever felt like you were just frustrated? Well if you haven't you ought to try being a pastor. Have you ever <laughs> been frustrated by trying to get people's attention? Or keep people's attention? Were you a parent? Did you ever have trouble getting your kids' attention or keeping their attention? Maybe you've been a teacher. Uh, I don't know. But it, have you ever been married? <laughs> Christy, Christy you say, she, her, her protest would be, I can't ever get you to listen to me. Pay attention. Well, that's a struggle, isn't it? I tell you what, God knows how to get our attention. Now, I would have thought by now at this stage in my life, that God would have the attention of this nation, but not so. And I say to you again, what's it going to take? What's it going to take for us to turn and give God our attention? Let's do it. Let's do it. The, late, the hour is late. We must give Him our attention. Believing for healing in Jesus' name, restoration, complete recovery. We're believing for great miracles. You that stand in need of God's touch on your life in any way, I pray that He will in fact uh, uh, move in a supernatural way upon you. Uh, God, God has blessings for His people. I mean, in the midst of the adversity, He still comes. I mean, for John, how could it have gotten worse? But, you know, in that, in that prison island, in that old rocky prison island, God broke through. He broke through into His life. And He gave us the last pages of our Bible that would be delivered to churches, real churches, with important messages about the unfolding of time and history. Father, thank You for Your Word. I uh, thank you for your people. I pray no one goes away from here not thinking about the great importance of us turning toward you. May we turn to see your voice as you speak to us. May we give our attention to you in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Thank you.